We're now going to talk about the costs of production. Uh, this chapter is pretty important for the rest of the, well, for the next three or four chapters. So the next three or four chapters are going to use what we learn here. So you need to learn this stuff, okay? And it's, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of uh, basic arithmetic, a lot of adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing and all that. Nothing fancy. And uh, a few definitions. Uh, a lot of the, the groundwork's going to be laid out here. And what we're going to do is we're basically going to look at why does the supply curve slope up? Why does it? Well, we're going to look at that uh, in a little bit different way. And how do the costs change as uh, output varies? Okay, well, to help us answer uh, these uh, questions, we're going to use something called the production function. A production function is uh, a technological relationship expressing the maximum quantity of a good attainable from different combinations of factor inputs. Okay, so it's the maximum you can produce from various combinations. Factor inputs would be labor, capital, okay? So we're going to write out the production function uh, to look like this. It is simply um, quantity of output is a function of inputs. There you go. That's pretty hard. Inputs determine the output. And we're going to say, we're going to divide up the inputs into two, two kinds of inputs. A fixed input and a variable input. And we're going to make it real easy. Uh, the production process, uh, okay, let me try to spell here. The production process is uh, uh, filled with lots of inputs. Some are fixed, some are variable. We're just going to use one fixed and one variable just to make it easy. And so uh, a fixed input. Let's, let's define, from again, more lots of definitions here. A fixed input does not change with the level of output. Okay, it's fixed. It doesn't change. So if you produce a little bit, the fixed input is fixed. If you produce a lot, it is fixed. Okay, so examples of uh, fixed input would be um, factories, heavy machinery, uh, land, uh, that kind of thing. So if you build a big factory, if you, if once the factory's in place, if you produce one unit or a thousand units, the factory is fixed. You've got it right there. Okay, an acre of land, whether you grow 10 acres of corn or a thousand, or, well, you can tell I don't grow corn. If, if you have 10 acres of land and you grow one bushel of corn or a zillion, uh, you still got that fixed input, th that acreage of land. So that just stays solid. And then a variable input. does change with the level of output. So variable input is variable, just, just like it says. It changes. So if I'm going to pr produce, uh, you know, if it's an automobile plant, and I, if I'm going to produce 10 cars, obviously I'm going to use less steel, less labor than if I produce 1,000 cars. I'm going to have to hire more labor. I'm going to have to use more steel, more uh, electrical wiring than if I only produce a, a little bit. So that, that changes uh, with the level of output a variable input does. 
uh, farming, you know, you're going to need, need more water. The more, the, more you pl the, the more you grow, the more water and fertilizer you use. The less you grow, the less you, you use. So, okay, now we got a, a couple more definitions here. The short run, a time horizon, okay? Short run, uh, a time horizon such that at least one input is fixed. And then the long run, all inputs are variable. All inputs are variable in the long run. Nothing is fixed in the long run. Even a big factory, okay? You can always build a new factory. You can always change the size of the factory, but it's going to take a while. You don't do it today. You don't do it tomorrow. You probably don't do it this year or next year. So we're, but, but long term, and we're not talking necessarily months or years. It's just whatever the time horizon is. Some industries, it's, it's longer than others. But it's just whatever it is such that uh, all, all inputs are variable. Now we are going to uh, go through some numbers. And we're going to have land. Land will be our fixed input. Okay, and our variable input will be water. And our output, Q, that's uh, wheat, okay? That's our wheat, the amount of wheat we're going to grow. Okay, so if we have one unit of land, let's say acre, let's just say an acre, okay. If we have one unit of land and we have zero water, we're going to have zero output. If we have one unit of land, now notice land is our fixed input, that's not going to change. We've got this fixed input, we're just going to keep adding and adding the variable input to it. Now we have one unit of water. I don't know, you know, an hour of irrigation time, uh, a water truck load, whatever. Doesn't matter. Just whatever a unit is, we have one unit of water. If we do that, we're going to have 10 units of wheat, maybe bushels of wheat, okay. And if we have two units of water to that one acre of land, we're going to have 40 bushels of wheat. Three units of water and 60 bushels of wheat. Four units of water added on that acre, 70 bushels of wheat. Five units of water, 75 bushels of wheat. And we'll stop here. Six units of water will give us 76 bushels of wheat. There we go. So, now we're going to calculate something called the marginal product. Marginal product is the change in total output divided by the change in the variable input. Okay, so that'll tell us 
for a one unit, remember the denominator always goes to one, for a one unit increase in the variable input, and we made it easy here, the units are one unit increases, but maybe they are, maybe they're not. But when you divide through, it will become a one. For a one unit change in the variable input, how much does total output change? What are we getting for that one unit of variable input? What's the bang here? What are we getting for the bang of our variable input? Okay. So, let's, uh, and the thing is, when we're dealing with marginal stuff, typically, we, it, it's, it's, it's a change. Okay, it's a change. It doesn't happen when it doesn't happen at zero units of water. It doesn't happen at one unit of water. Really, it's it's as we move, as we move from one to the other. So we're actually going to draw this. Um, kind of like that. We're going to put it over here. And that's a marginal product. So, going over here, let's, um, let's move that over just a bit. As we go from zero units of water to one unit of water, the change in the variable input is one. And total output goes from 0 to 10. So the change in total output is 10. So 10 divided by 1, we get marginal product of 10. And so forth. Okay. As, out, as the variable input goes from 1 to 2. Again, that's a change of 1. And in this, in this example, all of them are changes of 1, so I'll just leave that there. Output goes from 10 to 40. Well, that's a change of 30. Okay, so 30 divided by 1 is 30. Okay, so we do that all the way through. Change in variable output, variable uh, input, 2 to 3 is a change of 1. Output from 40 to 60 is a change of 20. 20 divided by 1 equals 20. And uh, so forth. 3 to 4 is a change of 1. 60 to 70 is a change of 10. 10 divided by 1 is 10. 4 to 5 is a change of 1, 70 to 75 is a change of 5, 5 divided by 1 is 5, and 5 to 6 is a change of 1, 75 to 76 is a change in 1, so the marginal product is 1. Now, it's the marginal product here that is of the greatest interest for us. And this is typical of all production processes. When a variable factor is uh, increased while holding other factors fixed. So what's happening here is you just keep adding more and more and more and more and more water. I mean, here with zero, you've got a desert, right? Nothing's growing. If we just keep on going with the water, we've got a lake and nothing's growing. So what's hap what happens in between is what we're interested in. Notice, in the beginning, marginal product is increasing. Those first couple of units of water is really doing some good. But notice that even though total output keeps increasing with additional variable input, it is increasing at a lower rate. It's added 30 here, it's adding 20 there. Still increasing, total output's increasing, but by at a lower rate. That fourth unit only adds 10 units. Fifth unit only adds five units. And the sixth unit of water only adds one unit to total output. Okay, this 
we call the law of diminishing marginal returns. The law of diminishing marginal returns, it's again, it's something we see in virtually any production process. And uh, well, let me give you another example. Let's say you're digging a basement. So the fixed input is just the land, the lot that the, the house is gonna sit on. You add one worker, you're gonna get a lot of output from that one worker. You add a second one, you're gonna add more output. Third, more, fourth, more. 10, 10 workers, 20 workers, 30 workers, 40 workers. Okay, that 40th worker isn't going to add very much output. Why? Because they're running into each other. The fixed input becomes saturated with the variable input. The variable, there's just too much variable input. There's not enough fixed input to, to work with. So you just overload. What you're doing is you're overloading the variable input. Excuse me, you're overloading the fixed input with the variable input. Another example might be a Wendy's restaurant. That's a former burger flipper at Wendy's. I, I like this example. Um, the fixed input is the restaurant itself, the building, the, the grill, the, you know, the, the, the tables in the dining room. There's a fixed amount. Okay, you hire one worker. One worker to take the orders, get the drinks, uh, cook the burgers, uh, do the french fries, clean the dining room tables. Add a second worker. Okay, that second worker is going to add a lot because now you got one guy doing the, the drinks and taking the orders, you got another one doing the burgers and the fries. Add a third worker. Okay, now you got someone taking the orders, someone doing the drinks. Someone doing the burgers and fries. Okay, you see where this is going. Let's go with four workers, five workers, six workers, seven workers. Now, now you've got eight workers. Now you've got two, two people taking orders, two people doing the drinks, two people doing the fries, two people doing the burgers. Let's go with 16. Okay, you've got four people on each job. So, so pretty soon you've got, you've got more. How much is that 16th worker going to add? to the output of burgers, to output of meals. Uh, pretty soon they're gonna be bumping into each other, getting each other's way. Uh, so what we are going to see, may, what we probably will see is increasing returns in the beginning. Maybe, maybe not, okay? We very well likely could see increasing returns, but ultimately at some point we're gonna see decreasing returns. So again, we're going to see two traits, probably increasing returns at first, but maybe not, not necessarily, but definitely we're going to see those decreasing returns ultimately. So um, we can uh, graph this. If we graph this, it's going to look something like this. If we have on this axis we're going to put marginal product on this axis and the variable input on this axis. What we see is uh, marginal product going up and then coming down. We have increasing returns and then decreasing returns as we keep adding and adding and adding that variable input. The law of diminishing returns has important implications for the cost of production. Cost depends on the price of inputs. Cost depends on the productivity of those inputs. Now we just saw the productivity of those inputs. That's what we we're just looking at the marginal product. That's what we mean by the productivity. We keep adding that variable input to the fixed input and we see how much output there is. The productivity of the variable input. Now we're going to look at the price of the inputs. Okay, so we're going to go through a lengthy ex example and uh, a lot of rows of numbers, and we're going to do that in the next lecture. 
but we're going to set it up here. So we have a production function. Quantity is a function of a fixed input. and a variable input. Now, the price of a fixed input, if we look at the fixed input and how much we have to pay for it, right? Shockingly, surprisingly, we call that a fixed cost. And if I threatened you, you'd probably guess what the variable input is called when we look at the price that we have to pay for it. We call that a variable cost. So the cost of a fixed input is a fixed cost. The cost of a variable input is a variable cost. And if we take the fixed costs, and we add to it variable costs. That is going to equal total cost. So again, fixed inputs don't vary when output varies. So fixed costs do not vary when output varies, right? If the fixed input doesn't vary, neither do the fixed costs. Variable inputs vary when output varies. That's why it's called a variable input. It stands to reason that variable costs don't vary either. Just seeing if you're awake, okay? Variable inputs vary and therefore variable costs vary. Got it. Okay, we are going to look at the price of land. Price of land is going to be, let's just say, uh, $100. That's the price of land. The price of water is going to be $10. And so we're going to go back and we're going to look at those variable inputs and the fixed inputs and we're going to figure out how much they cost. And then we're going to evaluate different costs. But we'll do that in the next one.